are the state's experts. And we could not have this program without you. And it's so important that we develop a good foundation about what we're going to be doing in SIMND because as I look to the future, that everything that you do is going to impact the lives of the state. And that's for every child, every newborn, every adult, every elderly person. And that's a pretty awesome thing, right? So as we get started, uh, were there any questions? We're going to talk about adult learning and why does it matter? And what we're, who you're going to be teaching are going to be adults, which are different than student learners. You know, today's student learners, they want to know the answers to the test. And we don't have any tests. We are going to be having some pre-tests and post-tests, and that's a requirement of CME. But it's more about the hands-on, about how we do something. And it was so interesting, Dr. Hunt from New York actually did a great study. She became very interested in pediatric CPR. And as she, she's a pediatrician, and as she looked at it, she wondered, you know, why does it take so long? And why aren't more kids, why aren't they being more successful at CPR? And so she made, she started doing some research, and she sat in the corner and watched. And I can't imagine that you'd sit on your hands and not jump in. But what she noticed was everybody was busy doing their job, except no one was doing CPR on the patient. They were getting the crash cart. They were calling the code. They were drawing up the meds. They were doing everything except the one thing that would have saved the life, OK? And so that's one of the reasons that the American Heart Association she was on their board, and that's why they've changed the CPR protocols for bystanders, that it's hands-only CPR, that we know that if we intervene immediately, that our outcomes are better. And so that's the same thing that we're going to be doing in SIMND. It's teaching the protocols and that high incident, low frequency event that can make a difference in individuals' lives. And from the very basics, from the EMT provider, that basic, that fireman who is on site, right on up to the physician in that. And it can be that tertiary center physician. And so that everybody does it the same way so that we get better outcomes in the end. All right, so our objectives, we're gonna be looking at describing the five steps of experiential learning and I know you're not back in college, but there's a couple of theories in my, I've gotten a lot of alphabet soup after my name, and it's all purely because of my own um, mission to learn, not because I think it's, you know, I don't have to be snooty about it. Okay, but experiential learning means that we learn best by doing it. And so an example of experiential learning is I took nursing students down to the mission. And of course, at our mission, they, everybody stands outside and smokes. And so that was their perception. It's a whole bunch of people who don't have a job, and all they do is smoke, and they're part-time. You know, they just stand around outside. And as they became involved in the lives of the individuals that were there, they found out that 80% of those individuals did have a job, that they were not using substances because they had to be drug tested before they could come in. And what had happened, that life circumstances had created an environment that did not allow for them to have a home or consistency or to have individuals who cared. And so by the experience of being there, changed their perceptions. Okay, so that's what experiential learning is about. It's about actually doing the event, the hands-on. Um, we're gonna give examples of open-ended questions. How, in debriefing and adult learning, there's a couple of things that we're gonna learn that you have to do it and then you've gotta reflect on it. And so how, as a facilitator or an educator, do you get the information from the learner rather than preaching it to them like a Sunday morning sermon, that you're getting the learner to reflect on their own learning. 
and we're going to explain Noel's six assumptions. That is one of the theorists that I happened to believe in. The other one is Patricia Benner, and she talks about novice to expert. And I think that's what happens to all of us. You know, I'm a pretty good labor and delivery nurse. And when I came to work for the Sim Center, they were talking about codes, like the one this morning. And I said, I'm standing in the background going, ah, you know, I can do CPR like this. <laughs> you know, that's what I know, rather than the actual getting in there. So I've had to become much better at understanding the cycle of CPR and with adults. Um, I didn't get to the last one, Joe. You went too fast for me. And we're going to discover what your own learning styles are. And I, you have maybe had that opportunity that you've been able to explore what your learning styles are. But the thing is, is that for us as educators, facilitators, that we have to understand how we learn and also the differences that others learn so that we can apply all of those principles to be able to make a difference for our learners. Okay, so what's different between an adult and a child? Well, adults, what do you think? Why do we learn something? Do we have to? I don't know. What does somebody else say? It's a want. It really is because we want to learn. It isn't anymore that we have to learn it. Unless it's ACLS and I have to learn those darn drugs to pass the test, you know? But if you work in a critical care setting or in an ER where that's something I'm doing every single day of my life, that's pretty important. So that becomes, that changes then to be different than a have to towards a want because it makes my job easier. Okay? We also have to unlearn. Yes, we have to unlearn things that we didn't may not have been so good at before, or we learned it the wrong way. How many nurses do I have here? Go ahead. Um, I don't know about you, but when I went to nursing school, oh, I got a nurse over here too. Um, when I went to nursing school, they told us that all the pillowcases had to face the window, <laughs> the opening. Do you know how come? Huh? No! <laughs> Because when you open and shut the door, all that germs are going to come in and fill the pillowcase and going to make the patient sick. You know, I don't know where we learned those things, but we did. And so that we do have to unlearn some things that were done wrong. And that along the way that there were some protocols that were set up that were done a certain way just because that's the way they've always been done before, not because it's based on the evidence. And so that's the thing with adults. We're actually doing the learning because it's important to us. It's a skill or um, something that we want to learn. One of the things that children learn because <coughs> children learn through a method, method of just copying. You know, our kids learn our behaviors. They become their parents because they copy. But that's the way they have to learn when they're younger. They see something being done, so they copy it. And as you get to be a young adult learner, you learn because you really have to. You know, I need a job someday, so I think I probably better go to school. So whether or not I like it, I'm going to school. And how many of your teenagers really love high school? They don't, but they're going through it because they have to. So their learning is out of necessity. But then when we get to adults, we have our jobs, we decide there's something else that we want to do. So then there becomes an extra motivation. And I like what people brought up. We have to unlearn things. We've developed frames of what we think are, this is the way it should be. We have to unlearn those. And then we get excitement about something else that says, you know, here's something new for me, and I'm challenged. So that the thing about adults, adults want to be challenged. And it's not a common teenager who wants to be challenged to get through the biology course. They're just, they want to just get through it. But now we learn because we have to, we want to, and then we're taking on challenges to keep us thinking, to keep us productive. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you want to think about is that many of you are experts in the field that you are in. I'm an expert in perinatal nursing. But if I went to work in the ICU and with a ventilator, mm, there's no way. That I'm not an expert in that. And so just like Patricia Benner talked about novice to expert, that there's a path that you develop to get there. And we're going to bring up that concept again, because what happens with an expert 
they have learned all those lessons along the way and things become automatic. And so especially when we're teaching other adults, we have to remember the process about how we got to where we are. So that, because we look at someone and think, why can't they do that? But it was because we didn't give them all of the steps to actually get there. Because in our expert mind, we've already done one, two, and three without even comprehending that we've done it. So experiential learning is the process of making meaning from the direct experience. And that's, we're gonna call that framing. And so later on in the lecture, we'll, we'll, I'll touch on that. Okay, so to make meaning of our learning, I need you to number off one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and we're gonna start here. <laughs> I know there's one in the crowd. <laughs> I need some help back there. Okay. One, two, three, four. What I have for you are tarps. You're going to meet together in a group. And I'm going to explain first that we are Sim and D. And what happens that we have a tendency to want to work in silos. I work at Altru. I work at Sanford. I work at Innovus. I'm at Trinity. Okay? And so what happens oh, yeah. with us, we, we want to be able to work together. We're going to make a cohesive team. And so as a team, we're going to discover how teams work together. So the nameplates that are in front of you, tomorrow when you come back, they're going to be in a new place and you're gonna get to know a new team. So don't be surprised, don't move your nameplate, by the way. <laughs> you set yourself up, Cheryl. <laughs> because we do want you to discover new friendships. So I need you to each take a tarp. You, you'll have to have someone on all four ends. There are five balls. So I want you to set up your tarp, put the balls on the tarp, on the green side up, and on the green side up, there are numbers, and so you're going to put the first ball in number one, the second ball in number two, three, four, and five. And for the team that wins, I have a prize. Okay? So, one, two, three, four. <coughs> Which one's one? One. Back there. That's one. Two. Yeah. Here's the tarp. Three, four, three. Yep. You've four. Changed, you've changed it several times. Oh, sorry. Several times. Sorry. Three. 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 I'm sorry. Cheryl, you, you want have them just to start or what? I'll tell you when to start. As soon as everybody has. Okay, put all five balls on the tarp. Ooh. Are you ready? Go! <coughs> Joel, put that back on the Put her back up.
Did you get done? Yeah. Here. We'll just set them back down there. The tarps are kind of dusty, so you might have to. I've got waterless hand cleaner back there. We can find some paper towels maybe to wipe off. All right. So find a place to sit. Which team was the winner? We were. We were. We were. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Did we have a judge? Playback. You were the judge. We're all winners. <laughs> I think you can yeah. go back. You can go back. I need the licorice out of there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I told you to get out of their group. Where was one? I mean, who was? Okay. So you can help yourself. And maybe they'll be nice enough to share. <laughs> so as you think about experiential learning and working together as a team, what kind of um, challenges did you have with the TARP? None. None? <laughs> OK. Well, one, that your leader didn't give you very clear dis description about wh which numbers were. I think if we would have, before we started, it said, okay, don't read those, you know, had more direction. I think we would have said, as a group, we said, just hurry up, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And is that something that we do as adults? All the time. All the time. You know, and we're going to find out what kind of learner does that, by the way. <laughs> what, what was good about the group? Everybody tried to work together. They had to. You couldn't make the balls go into the right holes if you didn't work together. What else? One group had an advantage. They had a larger hole than the rest. That was my fault. That could be a disadvantage, too, if you get the... Too many yeah. balls too close, uh, so yes. be careful. So we need good instruction, good leadership. We need to work together as a team. What else can you think of from the, the exercise? Communication. Good communication. Yes, you do. And is it always verbal communication? No. So as I'm doing this, we're thinking it's got to go that way, right? <laughs> or this, you know. All right. Yes. Good one. Okay. So with experiential learning, we will learn no matter what. Learning is as natural as rest or play. With or without books or inspiring trainers or classroom, will manage to learn. Educators can, however, make a difference in what people learn and how well they learn it. And if we know why we are learning it, and if the reason fits our needs as we perceive them, we will learn quickly and deeply. So, you know, did you have to know how to put the balls through the holes? Was that necessary? No, but the ability to work together as a team, the concepts of t being a team member is important. And so that's one of the ways, and we've got several exercises that we're going to be doing throughout the week about working together as teams. One of the things Malcolm Knowles uh, really wanted to key in on when he wrote this is that for us as adult learners, when we know why we're going to do this, that makes the learning a lot more <laughs> rapid and it sticks a lot better. So when you're educating these <laughs> providers, these docs, these nurses and paramedics. Sorry. <laughs> you just blew me away. <laughs> <laughs> when we're all doing these education things with all the docs and the other providers, they need to know why. And they're, they don't think, well, geez, somebody's out here trying to teach me what I already know. But they need to have a reason for doing it. And that reason may be that you're teaching teamwork or you're 
trying, in, in any effort, you're trying to help them improve what they already know how to do. So the bottom line eventually lies with better patient care. So if they have a reason that they can identify with, then they're going to learn a lot more from what you have to teach them. I can give you an example, a concrete one, that we were out to Western North Dakota to put on simulation. And it wasn't necessarily the thing that they <coughs> learned in simulation that was the most rewarding. What they found out in putting in chest tubes in the particular client or our simulator was that in their ER, they had the clamp over there and the suture kit over here and something else down there and it was spread everywhere. There wasn't even a list about what to collect to be able to do that. Was that going to be problematic in a particular emergent situation <coughs> of putting in a chest tube? Absolutely. So it was the experience of going through placing the chest tube and figuring out where everything was to make it cohesive to an actual emergent event. And so was that experience valuable to them? Yeah. Here's uh, five cycles of learning, and I'll just give Cheryl <coughs> a little verbal break. But these are the five cycles that we apply to learning, and then Cheryl's going to go through each one individually. But first of all is that experience. You're going to experience the simulation. You're going to experience the code blue or that patient with DKA. Then afterwards, you're going to kind of share what happens. Uh, gee, you know, Joe, how did that, how did that go? You know, I, I kind of thought, kind of screwed up there. What did you think? You know, you're, you're going to talk. You can share in our debriefing as opposed to the real life. Then you're going to get time to process that, to find out what was right, what was wrong. <coughs> Then you generalize that to other scenarios, to other actions, to your whole type of career, and you apply it and you experience it again. Mm -hmm. And so in experiencing, that means you actually just get in there and do it. And as we have set up simulation, that normally we go through a particular simulation twice, so that we have the learner come in and do the experience. And it's that first time activity. It pushes the learner beyond what they previously knew. And it may not be very comfortable. And that may be your experience because, you know, some of you have done simulations, some of you haven't. And, <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry, 10% <clears throat> of learners will always believe simulation to be real. 80% they can kind of get into it. And the other 10% never ever believe that it's real. And so our goal is to get the 80% to be able to buy into simulation so they can make it real enough that they can learn, they can do it, they can experience it. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Then once you've experienced it, you want to start sharing. So that's when we get into the debriefing. And what I've told some of you, we do a rapid debrief right after the scenario. Run 12, 15 minutes, we do a rapid debrief right at the bedside. And that rapid debrief is when we start sharing some experience. What happened, we start talking about it. And we may not give it away, we may not give the answer away, what the condition was, what the treatment was, but we, we walk the patient or the students through what they've done so far. Because if you end it there, they may feel like they've had a failure. They've run it once and, oh, man, the outcome was poor. If given another chance, I could do it so much better. So then we do, after that rapid debrief, we'll do another episode. And then at the end of that, we'll bring everybody together. <coughs> we'll, Sorry. Let me just turn your mic off or something. Yep. We'll want to do, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that experience. The everything from what went wrong to what could have been better. What were you, the big thing is what were you feeling during this? Because you'll find out that there's people that are going to sit in the corner and they won't say anything. And you're going to pick up well, what, you know, if you talk to them, find out what's wrong. And it just says, I'm ticked off at Dr. Allen because he thought he was God. He was running that thing and didn't let me get a word in edgewise. I'm never going to work with him again. And, you know, those are the teams who are going to work on every code, including the code when your parrot comes into that hospital. So you want to break those things down in a non-threatening fashion. And it's not going to be real easy, but we're going to talk about that. 
We want Thank those you. people to share what they felt. What were their reactions to this episode? What was their reactions when that patient coded or when they saw a response to something that they didn't expect? And these feelings we're gonna talk about because that's a big deal. We think, oh gosh, here it comes. Touchy-feely, huggy feelings again. That's not what we really want. We want to know how that person actually was feeling inside during that. What motivated that person to do or not to do what he did? Or when a mistake happened, we have to approach that carefully. But what, what was all about that? You know, what did they see, hear, feel, smell? And the smell is important too because everybody knows if they're a DKA, you, have that acetone smell. If they've got pseudomonas, they got that sweet grape smell. So there are smells to even simulation. And Tim and Cheryl are going to teach you some of the moulage where we actually do some of the smells. But then also finding what's the most difficult and what is the easiest part of the scenario. Because sometimes what you as instructors are going to think was the most difficult for them really wasn't. It may have been the most easiest. But we've got to find out where they're at so we can know how to educate them and the colleague that's sitting right next to them. So then we have to know, what's important about that scenario? What were your objectives? And we'll learn about that when we talk about teaching with objectives, but what was the important thing? Are you trying to teach them how to communicate with each other? Or are you teaching them to help recognize signs and symptoms? Or is the goal of the simulation to teach how to give the right drug? Or is the goal to identify the disease process? That's all too much for one simulation. So you gotta pick one or two of those. So if their goal is communication skills amongst the team, that's what's important. So you have to start identifying that and you gear your debriefing towards that. That's where you wanna get these um, students or these learners to talk about. And what kind of issues and problems arose during that simulation? You wanna bring those out as they relate to that goal that you have. And you're also going to find personalities will be a big deal and it'll interfere with all these goals. And if they're running more than one, the one uh, scenario or within one scenario is, this, is the same theme occurring over and over and over. And that's all those holes lined up as Dr. Jensen said. Is that theme building these holes every time? You guys are going to be able to see that. You'll see it so easily but when they're in the scenario they can't see that. So that's something that we have to help bring out for them. Then we can compare it to similar experience. What was the experience like for them just before they did the rapid debrief? Or Dr. Sather might say, well, you know, just last week I had that very patient, almost an identical patient in the emergency room, and that same thing happened to me. Here's how I worked through that. So then you're getting real life experiences with that as well. So generalizing, are you ready? Your voice ready? I think so. Okay. Generalizing is really the so what. You know, what does it matter if I do simulation? Or what does it matter if whatever I'm doing, does this teaching matter? And can we compare it to the real world? Our hope is yes, that simulation is created to reflect the real world as closely as possible, to give individuals the tools to be able to handle the situation that's coming up. Um, I have to tell a story on myself. Um, my team thinks I'm kind of jinxed and so that when you know I wrote about the football player with com or, uh, compartment syndrome our quarterback broke his leg and when the I next, wrote about the next Saturday football game UND that same day yeah we did it Thursday he did it Thursday I sh wrote about the shaken baby that article was in the paper in two weeks you know gas explosion it happened the next week so, no early childbirth. that's what I keep hearing. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to be careful. So I do try really hard to write the scenarios that reflect the real world. And then another thing about the real world, you all have experiences. You are very experienced at what you do. And it's kind of nice sometimes to hear real world experiences. You can do too much of that too. But using your real world experiences, when you see something happen in the simulation and it just triggers you and you think, oh, I gotta let them know this because it might help them prevent a problem. I would really rely on a lot of your real world, world experiences because a lot of these people in the critical access hospitals don't see as much as you do. They may not have seen any of these things that you have seen. 
So hearing it from you, the expert, is like gold to them. They mm -hmm. love to hear that story if it's real life and it's something that they can apply. And it was, um, they were talking about surgeons or, or residents that were gonna become surgeons, surgical residents, that's what they're called. My brain's not working today, I'm sorry. Anyway, it takes 120 times doing something to be able to make it real enough that it becomes a habit. And so how does a compartment syndrome in Hendrum become a reality? Are they gonna see 120 in the entire lifetime? A friend of ours um, is actually one of the volunteer ambulance members, and he said when they had 23, 24 members on their squad, they could go sometimes 14 weeks without a call. You know, so they would be on for a week and then it would be six weeks and then they'd be on again. And so that there were things that were happening in those other weeks, but they wouldn't have experienced it for 14 weeks. What does that mean for basic skills when you don't do it repeatedly in 14 weeks? And that's what many of our small ambulance, and I mean, that's what they're seeing, so that we have to be able to give them that real, real experience so that they can apply it. So when something comes up, they know what to do. Okay, we can go on, I think. Application, now what? <coughs> How do we change the behavior? Do you think Dr. Hunt's research changed the behavior in when to start CPR? I see one head shaking back there, no. We do have hospitals that are doing, I've forgotten the word, rapid response, rapid, response, rapid no. sequence. The, you mean the uh, simulation? Yeah, so they come in and they just do that, this one little piece of it, okay? And because they do it again and again and again and again, that people get in the habit of knowing that that's what they need to do. So they don't have to wait around to start something. And so it's the same thing, that they're getting them to practice so that it becomes, like what it's termed is muscle memory, and so that your body knows what it's supposed to do. So it's been given those 120 times to learn something, even if that you're not actually having to see the case. 120 times. And so is that useful for the future? You bet. That will impact every life in the state of North Dakota. So that we know that for every minute that you don't start CPR, that it's 10% that their life expectancy will decrease. So in 10 minutes. This is, uh, Dr. Jensen would take off on this slide uh, at 100 miles an hour because he has lots of experiences he can talk about but my son went through that program and he's a pilot and he called back once and talked about exactly what Dr. S Dr. Jensen did and talked to them about what happens when you uh, get a depressurization in the aircraft and he's flying this commercial jet and he's up in the air and all of a sudden they're starting to lose the air ca the, the cabin pressure and uh, just about before the oxygen mass deploy, he had to know what to do. He'd never done it in real life, but it was so absolute routine, he knew what to do, and, and so I asked him, how was it? Was it a little nerve-wracking? He says, yes, my heart rate was probably 120, but I knew exactly what to do, the sequence to do it, and I said, why is that? I did that so many times that it's, you just, you practice it over and over. So was it useful for the future? He said, you know, it's that one thing, Dr. Jensen told us, if we're lucky, if we're unlucky, it'll happen once in our career. So three years into his flying career, it already happened. And that's the same thing, that's the same concept that we're gonna teach some of these people. You already know it because you've lived it, but that one time it pays off. It mm -hmm. makes all the difference in the world. So to understand the cycle, it's important that we ask open-ended questions and so that it isn't, I saw you do. What happens if I say to you, I saw you do? Hmm? It blames, you bet. And as an adult, do we like that? No, we close up. And we're not, so that it's, explain to me that 
In this spot in the simulation, I noticed that you did such and such. Can you tell me about that? Why did you choose that? Why did you do it that way? Is that going to be easier for you to tell me what you were thinking? What do you think? I hope so. We had a nurse. Um, I'll tell you that one tomorrow. Never mind. We need hands-on participation that adults really need to be able to do it. We need to feel it, we need to see it, we need to smell it, we need to do it. And we need discussion about it afterwards because that's how we implant it, that's how we make it real. And the active reflection in groups is one of those things that helps us do that, is that the group learning, that someone else can say, well, I didn't know what you said to me, can you tell me that again? And that's sometimes really hard, especially in a profession that we are type A personalities. You know, nobody likes to be wrong. And in a crisis situation, you know, people say things they didn't mean. Or they say it wrong. I have this thing, I think I have mindlexia, that what my brain sends out, my mouth doesn't say. <laughs> and so poor Dr. Allen has to he kind of looks at me funny. The rest of the group has figured out what I really said, but he misses it. Yeah. What? Yeah. So we have to describe it. So, some, so we have to know that about our team members as well. And um, I forgot. Well, so we're talking about the, the discussion and knowing what people are saying and reflecting in the groups. That's when the people talk about what they're, uh, how did you view that experience? We talked about that a little bit. That comes in as part of the cycle. We've got to get that part of the cycle when you're teaching. And then the real world connections, even though this is a simulation, most of the time it's easily applied to the real world. They'll understand it, but sometimes they may not. So you as the educator have to make mm -hmm. that connection. And then we have to apply that to independent situations because the one situation that you just taught them with the simulation, that might be uh, an episode of cardiac ischemia, but there's a lot of learning that can go on with that one that you can put onto some other independent situations in real life. So it's, it's like taking the teachable moment that you have with them to help them go a step further. And adult learners do like that. There's not, it's not redundant, it's not like, gee, I don't need to be here. There's that 10% who it will be like that, but the majority of them are gonna suck up everything that you teach them there. And it's, we went to Fargo a couple of weeks ago and presented four simulation cases. There was one on congestive heart failure, one on um, GI bleed, there was a cardiac arrest, I think, no, the DVT. And the third one, or the fourth one was a pediatric burn. So how many pediatric burns do you think that the VA hospital sees? <laughs> what do you think? Any? No. But are the principles of caring for a burn patient the same, whether they're this size or that size? Yeah, so there's transferable information. And so even though it, they don't deal in pediatrics, there are concepts that are valued in the learning that can be transferred to another case. Dr. Jensen was talking, I think, uh, a little earlier about you know, that, that single guy, flat top, who thought he knew about raising kids and everything else, you know. But that's that experience that we have that gives us that ability to teach this to other people. So that knowledge, it's just a, a statement from a report there that's helpful for us. Malcolm Knowles is uh, way back <coughs> in the 50s and 60s. In 1968, he published some of his theories of adult learning. And he had four uh, assumptions. And then back in 1980, he added two more assumptions to that. So there's a total of six assumptions. And these are listed right here, and we'll go through those for you. But th these are his assumptions of learning in adults, why, why adults learn and how they learn. Cheryl. OK, need to know. Adults always want to know, why do we need to know this? Doesn't matter. And so I'm going to ask, if a rooster sits on the border of Kansas and Oklahoma, where would the egg drop? Here. 
He says, who cares? Huh? They are together. Thank you. They don't lay eggs. <laughs> a blue man lives in a blue house, and a red man lives in the red house. Who lives in the white house? The president. The president. Yes, thank you. So were you, you weren't swayed by my blue house on there? Thank you. If you were in a dark room with a candle, a wood stove, a match, and a gas lamp, which one would you light first? The match, thank you. But, okay, now you ask a child that. And I asked my 11-year-old, I, I, I did these to her this weekend, or last two weeks ago. And she had to stop and think about it a whole lot. Why would she have to think about it and hopefully you knew the answers? My med students would look at that last one and they'd, they'd have to look twice. And if I said the match, they'd say, no, you're wrong. This is a trick question. I know that there's something in there that they're trying to get us. So they would jump through all these hoops and get to this bizarre answer. But <laughs> Look on your cell phone? Oh, yeah. There oh, you go. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But the thing is experience. And number one, it's kind of nonsensical information. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it unless we want a good laugh for the day. But the other thing is, that our experience has told us that we have to light the match first or that a rooster can't lay eggs, where kids don't have that experience to build upon yet. Okay, let's go to the next And then when you start reading, it, it's our frames and the way we look at things and just our experience of looking at it. We look at the, the whole, not the individual things. Every one of you can read this pretty clearly and you can get right through it, but you look real closely and you think, this is really weird writing. But in essence, if the first and the last letter of the word are the original and are correct, everything in between can be scrambled and your brain is going to read it. So you're, you're going to have the knowledge to understand because you go over it very fast. That's experience that you've had. You, you look at the word, the first and the last letter, and you've got it. And you can read this whole thing. But again, there's where the experience comes in. And our brain has already set patterns for us so we can get through things quicker. Those people who haven't had that experience aren't going to be able to get through this really quick. Somebody who grew up in China and is just learning English, they're not going to be able to do this because they have not had the ability reading as much English or experience as we have had. So that's going to be a difficult problem for them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I look at Dr. Sather's notes. This is one of them, but no, <laughs> All right, self-concept. This is one of the other foundational things that we use for adult learning. And adults need to be responsible for their decisions in education and involved. And so that we want to create learning that's important to them and means something when we get done. It isn't just... You know, okay, you all work for hospital systems, health systems. How many of you have validation day? Yeah? And you go through it every year. Fire safety race. R-A-C-E. Oh, yeah. Got all those quizzes to take. And I want to know, for you have all had experience how many actually read through all the tutorials before you do the quiz? Anybody? You just take the test, right? Well, that's because of experience. And, you know, we don't have time to waste on that stuff. So it's amazing how much that you build upon year after year. And Lord help me if they have a fire for real. My husband's the fire chief, so I should know the remove, you know, close the doors, sound the alarm. But okay. you, can, you can all take those tests and you can fill out the forms without having studied the, uh, over and over and over every year because you're taking responsibility for <coughs> your own learning and you know your own abilities and you can do that. But again, unexperienced people, that, that can't happen that way. They can get frazzled by something for you. It takes you three minutes and you're done. All righty. Okay, you can't look at your papers. 
How do you put a giraffe in a refrigerator? <laughs> Small pieces over That'll there. Work. Anybody else? Shoot them first. Yeah, open the door. Put them in. Shut the door. Right? So let's go on. Yep, yeah, that's it. Just open the door and put them in. And this te question tests whether you tend to to do th simple things in an overly complicated way. So if you're gonna cut them up, this is the adult mind, you know? <laughs> we gotta make it as complicated as possible, right? I like that, David, it's the North Dakota way. <laughs> Shoot it, cut it up, put it in your bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty simple. All right, go to the next one. So how do you put the elephant in the fridge? Hmm? You read ahead. <laughs> you just know it. <laughs> Most people would say, just, op just open the door and put them in, because that's what we did the first time, right? We learned from the first example. Well, no, you got to take the giraffe out first so we can put the elephant in there. Okay. This tests your ability to think through the repercussions of your previous actions. If you made the wrong choice. Yeah, if you made the wrong choice. Okay, so the Lion King is hosting an animal conference and all the animals attend, except one. What animal's not there? Hmm? <laughs> It's the elephant, because he's in the fridge, yep. That's right. And so, okay, if you didn't get any of the ones above, and I know I've got some adults up there that maybe didn't, we've got one question left. And there is a river that you must cross, but it's used by the crocodiles, and you do not have a boat. How do you manage it? You send your buddy across, not you. <laughs> exactly. They're all at the meeting, so you can just swim across. And this tests whether that you learn quickly from your prior mistakes. It's interesting that 90% of professionals get all these questions wrong because we think so hard about stuff. We make everything so complicated. That's exactly right. It's not just open the airway, it's oh yeah, well, I'll make sure they have a pulse. Time for a break. Anyway, that this is the quiz is called, Are You Smarter Than a Kindergartner? But what happens along the way is we've developed all those other things that provide the layers of information on top. So just like the giraffe, you know, he's too tall. He can't fit in the fridge. We've got to cut him up or an elephant's not going to fit. And so it's the, our experience layer on that makes something not real or unreliable. But it's the same thing with learning. It's that experience that helps us discover. So, okay, we can go ahead for a break. Let's. Yeah, we can yet. break. Okay. Okay. Break? Where do they go? You go ahead, I'll just check with Joel. Okay. So, we'll take a 15 minute break. Is that okay no, no, with everybody? No, you, you keep going, I'll check with Joel. Well, hold on. Hold on. Okay. Imagine that. I have a question. Well, yes. Well, Joe. I, I wrote a note what time for the break? Um, who decides what time for the break?
Okay. Thank you for coming again. Yes. <coughs> Okay. As we began this process um, three years ago, we actually did send out a survey to the entire state looking at what were the concerns of critical access hospitals and what were the things that they needed education about. And pediatrics and OB, of course, are the biggest, scariest fields for them because they see so little of it. There are 11 hospitals in the state that continue to do labor and delivery. And now there are places that it's two and a half hours or more <coughs> from where you live to get to a um, facility that actually provides childbirth services. And so that is a scary thing. And um, we will be providing advanced classes about teaching childbirth later in the fall when the Medi is in the production phase of developing that mannequin. So we will be doing that later. The mannequins that come with the truck is an infant and it's a top about nine months of age. Um, it's a pediatric mannequin that's about five years of age and an adult mannequin that is um, multi-gender, male or female or either, I don't know. And so that what we have written are about 21 scenarios that will be available that cover kind of a plethora of things. And so you will be experiencing six of those simulations this week. And so remember that it, the scenario may not be something that they're going to see in Hillsboro, but the concepts of the scenario will be transferable to every place. So it's related to, well, I don't want to spill the beans because that's tomorrow's lecture. So readiness to learn. That's where you ended. Our, ready, our readiness as adult is really related to our wanting to learn. And it's going to prepare us for new social roles. So if I'm getting a new job, it's really kind of important that I learn the new job, right? Otherwise, I'm not going to stick around very long. So we have a vested interest, and it often has to do with um, money, or it has to do with prestige or it has to do with accomplishment, where kids have to learn it just because. And I found it interesting. I got to use math, algebra, for the first time in 40 years, a couple of weeks ago. So my math teacher was absolutely right. Yeah, you'll use it again. I had to figure out a hemoglobin on somebody that I didn't have the actual hemoglobin result. I had all the other MCV, I had all the other values, but not the hemoglobin. So I had to backtrack and figure it out. And I could still do it, which was fun. All right, readiness. I forgot where I was. Orientation. It matters what we've learned before. So just like Patricia Benner, that what we have based our knowledge on, that we build upon that knowledge to become an expert. And so, anybody know what this one? Oh, wait, go back, go back. No. Joe, Go help. forward. You're going backwards. Okay. Now, which one's my point? There. Where's my point? Top. Top. Top one. one. That one. Anybody know what that one is? Big bird. Big bird. You bet. And so once we've given a frame of reference, so it helps that you can then kind of figure out from there after you've been given the frame of reference. So this one's pretty easy. 
Ice Cube, you bet. How about this one? Long history. Or history repeats itself. Yes, it does. Um, and you know what? I don't have the answers. Anybody know? Oh, there. You bet. And? Yep, land before time, one in a million. <laughs> and I had it written on my other one, there, um, my other slide. And actually, these are one of the brain twister things that they encourage um, older adults to use and so that you keep your brain fresh. But it really is the experience that allows us to know how to answer those puzzles. So whether it's a crossword puzzle or a scrabble or whatever it is. And so as a person learns new knowledge, he or she wants to apply it immediately to the problem solving. So once we figured out Big Bird, then we could make sense out of the rest of them. Motivation, you know, what does it matter? And so as a person matures, he or she receives their motivation to learn from internal factors. It used to be because we got good grades, we'd be, you know, in my day, <coughs> way long time ago, I'd get a quarter for an A. How much you have to pay kids now? Like 10 bucks. Huh? You don't pay them. Pay kids. For the tooth fairy, I got a dime. Five bucks for a tooth now? Holy moly. <laughs> so, time changes and the motivation for that changes as well. Adult education enhancement. And so we take all of that stuff that we've learned and that in adult educational enhancement, it promotes the skill development. So we get better at what we're doing. And so by doing um, intubation again and again, we get better and better at it. And so that we've developed that muscle memory and when we apply it, it becomes second nature. It helps alleviate the fear, man, if we had a code in OB, I would be shaking in my shoes because we don't do codes in OB. Remember I said they're like this, little baby ones, and usually about three bags and the kid is screaming bloody murder. I heard they had a code in our OB a couple of months ago. It's like, I wasn't there, I was here. Thank you. Um, it also helps providing critical thinking and so that we've been able to process it and put the pieces together for it to make sense. Um, adult education actually promotes creativity. This is the best job I've ever had because when I was a little girl, I wrote plays, I sewed costumes, I mixed up stuff like a mad scientist under the stairs. You know, I used coffee grounds on my brother to make whiskers for a play. And I got to do all of that thing, all of those things in simulation. So I can help write the story, the play, and put it to good use now. And as I watch students, that little light come on, that, that now they, um, something makes sense because they've been actually to see it and to do it, that they know what the medication is gonna do to the patient. And so that you've got the right amount. Oh, I'm, I'm a bad teacher. I had a med student give 10 milligrams of morphine IV push here the other day. And so my patient stopped breathing. And he just kind of looked around, you know. What's going on? And I said, well, do you think it was too much? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they puked one day too, and then they called the operator and said, we've got a patient throwing up in the room too. And I said, well, do you want a janitor? What would you like? <laughs> It helps with understanding and discernment. So when we see something, we practice something now, that it stays in our memory so when we have to do it again, it's there and available. We have greater opportunity and it moves a person towards our goal in the end. And our goal is with SimND that we can actually have better outcomes, better patient safety for all, everyone within the state. So learning styles, we've got three kinds of learning, the auditory, visual, and kinesthetic, that usually individuals will learn by reading the book. How many 
right now know that you're the, a better book reader than you are sitting in lecture. Nobody? Well, we're going to find out. An auditory is actually listening to the lecture and finding out if that's how you should do it. Or kinesthetic is the hands-on, actually doing it. Okay, so that's the touching part. So there may be an optimum style for you as a facilitator or an educator, but there's also learning styles that your students or your learners are going to have. So we're going to go on to a practice. In your binders, there should be three pieces of paper. In the back, there's a yellow, a pink, and a blue. And I want you to t write your name on the bottom of all three pieces. You're underneath your collar, your microphone. Okay, so are you ready? So we're going to test the auditory first. I don't remember which color I'm supposed to have. Yellow. Okay, has everybody signed all three pieces of paper? All right, with your yellow piece of paper, I just want you to follow my directions as I verbally speak them. I want you to fold it the long way and make a crease down the middle. Jeff, where's your paper? He doesn't have a book. You don't have a book? I don't wonder if there's any back there. Check mine, Amy. Okay, then I need you to open the paper back up. And at the top, I want you to fold it down by about a half an inch and then fold it again three times over itself. Fold it back and forth. Okay, after you've made the three fold, I want you to fold it back up on the fold that you'd made prior the long way. And now take a corner and f I can't do kinesthetic. I can't use my hands. <laughs> you want to make um, a V, so you're going to fold it down towards the center line. So as you, okay, open, wait. Open your paper back up so it's laying, looking at you. Okay, there you go. Now take the corner and fold it to the center to make a V. There you go. Yep. And do it the same on the other <coughs> side. And then you're going to fold the plane in half. So you should have, it should look like a plane. Yeah. You got it? All righty, so set that one aside. We got everybody done? <coughs> In your packet are visual instructions, and there are steps one through five. So I'm going to have you use the pink piece of paper and follow the visual instructions to make your second plane. directions in there. There should be. They're for back almost to the tab. It's one page.
You can't talk out loud, you just have to read. Pictures around it all, or do they want us to keep it identical? If it, if it, Jeff, Jeff will need the handouts. Jeff will need the handouts for the next part. I'll talk to you later. Cheryl, do you need I don't. Mind? I don't know if there's anything in mine. I thought it was empty. Well, yours is empty. Then you can look. Okay, how you doing? Everybody done? <laughs> All right, now we're going to try the kinesthetic, the hands-on. So what you need is your blue piece of paper. And you're going to follow along with me. So take your blue piece of paper, you're going to fold it the long way and make a crease. I don't know what she wants. Okay, then you're gonna open your paper back up and put it down and fold the top down. Make a half an inch fold. I'm not aware of what she wanted. She didn't and tell crease. Me she wanted then fold it over itself to make a second fold. Anybody see? And then a third fold and crease it. Then we're going to fold the airplane down in a triangle to make the wing and make a crease and do the same with the opposite side. and open it back up and I should have a plane. So, <laughs> did everybody's? Yep, and now fold it opposite way, yep, and fold it down. Okay, now I've got, you've got your plate, right? All right, so what I want you to do is to stand up where you are and throw the planes towards me. And I've got prize, <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Oh, there's a good one. Anybody else? Good job. Keep coming. I've got some more. Well, I have five, six. Well, There's another one right there. I can tell you none. Yeah, I've got one in there. 
none of you are very good visual learners. I didn't get one yellow plane up here. <laughs> so, my ears huh? <laughs> <laughs> but it was <laughs> out of Except no uh, yellow was auditory. I think she has separate. Okay, sorry. See, already, already I've mixed. I told you I mixed it up between my brain and my mouth. Because she didn't tell us to have one. Chuck, I've got one here for you. For you. Which instruction was easiest to follow? I know she wants separate hands. The visual one? <clears throat> and then I have Erica and Tamara Margot and David. So that's what she wants to see. <coughs> There's more in there. You can pass them, well, pass them just around. Leave them in there and I'll give her the binder. But that's just an example of how <coughs> what happens that it can change in translation. So if you can't follow along the instructions that the educator is providing how difficult it can be. And so if your learning style is different than what the instructor's learning style is, that creates a barrier or a problem. And so that we have to be able to work around those. So when you're facilitating, you want to be aware of and cognizant of different learning styles. In your packet, there is actually a little quiz for you to take about your learning style. And it should be right after the PowerPoint. It shouldn't take you very long. So it says, what's your learning style? So it looks like that. We'll find you a pen. The thing, don't read the questions too hard. Just make a decision quickly. Nope. Best one. Don't overthink it. Once you've answered all the questions and total up the number of A's, B's, and C answers, or the first answer, second answer, third answer, at the bottom of the page,
So is everybody about done? So what did you discover? How many of you are actually visual learners? That it's easier to read the book? We've got a couple. And that's awesome. So as an adult learner, what's happened is that you have been able to use a variety of techniques to develop your own learning style. OK, how many are more auditory? We've got a couple. And how about kinesthetic? Hands on, we've got one. I'm actually probably more kinesthetic as well. So when you think about, OK, let's think about if you were going to teach someone how to start an IV. How would a visual learner teach the technique? You would show them, OK? So a visual learner, I need to back up a slide. A visual learner usually wants to read about it. Nope. I'm going the wrong way. There we go. <coughs> Reading the book. So visually, how would you do that? Step three. Give them the process. Define it. How about the auditory? Talk to them about it. Describe it. And how about the kinesthetic or the touching? Show them. Absolutely. So when you're going out to teach, you want to think about the process in the simulation. You know, what's the goal? What are we trying to get at? Are we teaching a skill? Are we teaching communication? Are we teaching teamwork? And then how do we incorporate the style of the learner? And so someone may have a really blank look on their face if we just said, well, you need to do A, B, and C where you actually have to show step what A, step B, step C is. OK. I'm going to go past this again. All righty. So I didn't have, you were kind of mixed up. How about if we do this? I'm going to make this one, huh? You don't have just one. Can I make you, can I make you visual learners? OK, this group over there. This group will be auditory learners. And this group will be kinesthetic learners. And so I want you to brainstorm some facilitator strategies for being able to apply. I've got some poster board back here. OK, so you need to kind of get in your group. <laughs> it's sometimes hard to follow where Cheryl's going. Here. I know. Huh? Here's a marker. Here you go. I can get all those. You can do your learning here. about eight minutes or so. Can you come up with a list of things that facilitators, tricks that they can use to help Thank that you, particular style of learner? recording for going on the internet. 
So, <coughs> so what they're doing is they're all going to brainstorm an mm -hmm. idea of visual, kinesthetic, and auditory learning, okay? At the wrap-up at the end, when we're all done, I want to just talk about, um, you know, just give the, making it kind of like an open mic and ask them uh, what important things that they're, they identify and what can they add to each of the different things, you know, like what can they add to what our introduction was, what do you need to know, what do you want to know. Mm -hmm. Not that we'll answer it all, but that we'll get it done for the rest of this week. And then for the uh, um, stuff from the State Department of Health, uh, from Warren Jensen's and from Adult Learning, what are things that they want that we can add to? I think if there's uh, markers on the whiteboards, I'll just use the whiteboard for that. <coughs> Do you have some Fenergan with codeine at home? No. Call your doc and ask for it. I mean, pick it up on your way home. You really, you got to have something to keep you from coughing at night so you can get some rest. Or, I don't, have you ever used Teslon pearls? Teslon pearls? And you swallow them, not bite them. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. you get, if you can tolerate Fenugan with codeine, you get, get something. I wouldn't. Uh, <coughs> I can only imagine because I was there on last Sunday. I couldn't speak without coughing. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't none of that. Yeah. Oh, I feel like almost back to normal. I just have a tickle when I start talking. My throat gets dry. I know. That's why this, this morning I had to suck that water down just to. It was yesterday. In the morning I felt pretty good. Let's just kind of walk around and see how they're doing with it. Are you guys visual learners? Yep. The visual? Okay. Lighting. Lighting. Are you guys the kinesthetic or auditory? Auditory. Auditory, okay. Because you notice we didn't write anything on the paper because we're auditory. You guys are smart. Yeah, that's the toughest part. I have a class of 70 students at a time, and it's the toughest part because some of them are a little bit of each. And if you specify auditory, then your evaluations you get slammed because they want to have visual and if so then the next lecture you do visual you get slammed because they wanted kinesthetic you know so you really that's a you guys are going to get evaluated in teaching so going through all this kind of helps you a little bit it seems childish but it helps because when you read your evaluations you're going to say damn what I thought I did all, we did all right who's this jerk that slammed me for, it's going to happen and then you just learn, you kind of get it to everybody somehow. It's, it's, I'm when you, not always a visual guy, but I, I'm stronger when I you kind of see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And add some hands-on, it evens better, too. That's why I said the props. With like a slide. We're all seeing the same thing. It's like hard to. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's like hard to do.
you must be married. Oh. That would be awesome. Good job. It's tough when we all run around, isn't it? Oh, it's better. Oh, good. <laughs> Are you trying to get the video back? Or the In me? Oh, sure. <laughs> All right, how about our auditory groups? Well, since we're auditory, we decided we wouldn't write it down because we all might be missing. <laughs> uh, things we came up with was um, setting things to music, like CPR is staying alive. Perfect. Good job. Okay. How about our kinesthetic learners? Perfect, and we're gonna do that on Thursday. And then uh, we also thought maybe it would be good at dog shadow or um, being involved with and ride along with a um, mm -hmm. like a ambulance or it could be anything though, it could be like even private writing or business or something like that. Great ideas, and we're gonna save those because we're gonna use those again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One of the things that um, some of us have talked about, about these learning styles, it's, it's kind of a, a kid's thing to be doing all of this, but the, um, the importance of it is, is that you're going to be teaching multiple groups. And your groups aren't going to be as big at one time as my medical student groups. But when I get a bunch of medical students in there, these are all top of the class. You know, they're all four-point college students. They're all high achievers, obsessive, compulsive, types of people, but they all have different learning styles. So you develop your instructional method and you go up and you teach a clinical skills course. And you think it really went well and there's a lot of the students come up and say afterwards, Doc, it was really good, I really learned a lot. You know, the people who enjoyed it will come up and tell you. And then you get your evaluations at the end of the block and you can't believe what you see. What planet did Alan come off of? You know, all we did was get our hands on. We didn't get any instruction on doing anything. Or, you know, I really would like to be talked to more, or I would really like to have it all in writing. Or then somebody else says, gee, why can't we get our hands involved more? And 
as much as you try to involve as all the styles, there's going to be those learners that are just going to be ticked off because you didn't hit their style of learning. And the one thing about generations now, it's all about me. Everybody wants it their own way, and if you don't do it their own way, it wasn't good for the whole group. So be aware of that. That's going to happen when you're teaching, even in the small groups. When you get your evaluations back, you'll find that some of them you just say, I walked out of there with such a great feeling, and man, they just, they just nailed me here. Well, it's not that you did it wrong, you did it bad, that you weren't teaching right. It's that their learning, most likely their learning style was not met. And with adult learners, they can be very critical on how we do things. So doing these little exercises is very helpful because as much as you're brilliant, experienced people, you're going to have to teach brilliant, experienced people. And you've got to hit all the different methods. Like some of you in this group, I can tell you right now, are saying, this is a bunch of crap. Writing down on a piece of paper what kinesthetic things is, Shh, this is kids' play. And I know some of you may be thinking that. Others are going to say, wow, you know, I, I really see the point of it. And it's all our own learning styles. So we're trying to get you involved and let you see that so that you know what you're going to experience when you get out there. I'd love to have you all come with me when I go lecture to the medical students and see how the class responds and then see the evaluations afterwards to see what it's like. Then you'll find out when you start reading what people really want. Uh, it changes a lot how you do things. And then you have to do a lot of adapting too. So. Okay, so one of the things with the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, there can be combinations of these learning styles. So as much as somebody may love the hands-on, how can you do the hands-on unless somebody walks you through it in the verbal or gives you the written directions? Well, like following the, the directions to how to make the airplane, then you do it. Then the next time, you don't have to look at the directions, you've learned it. But if somebody just tells you, if you fold this way, unfold it, fold three times this way, then fold down in the corners, and now go do it. It's a little bit harder. But if I would do that and show it to you here, it'd be a little bit easier. And if I do it and show it as you're doing it, it would be even easier than you could go teach somebody else. So the combination is what most of the learners, adult learners, are going to use is a combination of it. But... It, there's some things that it doesn't enhance. The adult learner is given specific views towards controversial issues. When you start getting into controversial things, uh, we're not going to do a lot of enhancing of learning when it comes to that. We may be able to clear up some of the controversies. We may be able to talk about the pros and cons, and we may end up coming agreeing to disagree, uh, but having some kind of an adult agreement there. If we get the learner to come to a premature closure, so if we're trying to push them through too quickly and they, they decide that they want to just get over the learning and we let them go to a premature closure without getting the appropriate teaching, if they've missed the point, they're all there about giving the right, getting the right diagnosis and giving the right drug. You're there to teach team learning and we, we close it before we get that team leading thing in there then we've missed the point and it won't, we won't get any enhancement there. If they're given the answers, rather than arriving at them independently, they may not learn. That is a huge thing in our medical school. We tell the students when they come on board that we're going to give you in paper form, we're going to give you in the binders, in our lectures, and in your handouts, 80% of everything that you need to know to pass your board exams. 20% you're still going to get tested on, in our, in our class, but it's not going to be given to you. There's not enough time. So you have to get back and do some of your own learning. So 20% of that learning is going to be on your own. We tell the students that, but do you think at the end of the block, when the test comes out and that question's on there, you know, nobody taught me this. They, they, it's a, you have to tell them, you have to write it down in their orientation, and you have to reinforce it multiple times. Um, but if you give them the answers, that 20%, if we would give 100% of everything they needed to know, what kind of doctor do you think they would be? If we spoon-fed them, brilliant young people that are spoon-fed and never have to go do the research to figure out how to, 
how to find an answer. They'll work really good until they get to something they've not met before, until they get to a disease that they've never seen before or a condition they can't figure out. And so they're going to try to figure out with their own frame that this is the way I've done it. So they're going to start treating things wrong because, no, this is what it is. They told me everything I need to know in med school. So we give them that 20% they have to look up so they know how to find out the answers on their own. So one of the things that we can't do is just enhance that learning on their own. Um, if we don't challenge them, uh, if you're not challenged to do something, you hit a plateau, and that plateau gra gradually deteriorates. And all of you know that if you're not challenged, what, what is a day if you're an ICU nurse, if you've got two patients in there and they're very stable, you get no admits, there's nothing going on on the, on the cardiac monitors, the day goes slow, and then all of a sudden, the end of the shift, and you think, oh, man, I forgot to get this dude. I forgot to do that. Oh, my gosh, I forgot all these things. Or you go home and you realize oh, it was so slow, you weren't challenged, so your brain kind of turns off. So what we have to do with the learning, we have to challenge those those uh, learners that are going to come into the sim center, into your truck, you're going to have to give them some challenges. If it's just a boring repeat of something they already know and they're really good at it, uh, it's going to be difficult. They're not going to learn. They're not going to like it. So that's where you have to pull out some of the stops and ad lib a little bit. Uh, add some challenges in the case to them. Add some what ifs. So you get through the scenario and it's a piece of cake. You're in, this, you're in the debriefing period. And it just sounds like you got a group that's just bored stiff. Throw a curveball at them, saying, "Okay, in the same scenario, in my in my case, in the case I had a couple of weeks ago, we had this happen, and it's different from what they just said. What would you do differently now? You know, start throwing scenarios at them where they have to start thinking. When you challenge them, that's when you see their engines start up again, and they'll really start going." <clears throat> they can accumulate all this information without contextual re relevance if they have the right things, the right skills, the right knowledge in order to build it. And they can interpret these things and reflect them, but they have to have that ability to be challenged. They have to have the ability to have a safe atmosphere to do this. All of those, say, we could talk an hour on that last one. But we can get these people to learn, even if they're bored, even if they're angry. And it's but there's certain things we can't enhance unless we do those things. So in just review, we're talking about how we apply the adult learning styles to teaching simulations. So we wanted you to learn how to use the kinesthetic, the visual, the auditory learning, and the combination of them. You all know about all this stuff, but now we want you to try to bring it together. And in this ne rest of this week, and then in the second week, especially when we're doing more simulation, <clears throat> and then in the third week, when you're doing it in the trucks with each other, you're doing the actual teaching. Be thinking of all these things so that when you're teaching one of your colleagues or Minot's team is teaching Altru's team, um, you're thinking, okay, how is this person going to learn? I can see one of the things that they're really good at, but maybe some instructions needed. Be thinking of those things because you're teaching people who are going to be teachers at a much higher level than what you're going to go out and, and instruct to. That doesn't, I'm not discrediting the critical access hospital EMS knowledge. It's just that you're teaching teachers now, so it's going to be a little more difficult. So when you get out there in the, in the field, so to speak, it'll be a little bit easier. We want to make it real, make it relevant, make it applica applicable to what they're going to do uh, so that we can learn a whole lot better. So there's uh, <clears throat> one more story. When I came to the medical school, I would practiced in Minot for several years, then I moved to Grand Forks, and my first task was to write the curriculum. They had a new curriculum, but to write the second year clinical skills curriculum. So I spent the first two months just pouring through all these um, studies, all these things that, they, that the med schools have to put down. All of the objectives of the becoming a physician. Which objectives do they have to meet to get their MD degree? Then pull out the clinical skills and start working on the curriculum. And so when I was in Minot, I taught medical students all the time. Third and fourth year medical students and family practice residents. So I'm thinking at that level. Now I'm back down to first and second year med students. 
So can you guess how my first few lectures went when I was the lecturer? I'm lecturing up at this level. And they're all, they're all happy. They say, geez, this is stuff we've got to know. But we have not a clue what you just told us, Dr. Elm, in the last two hours. I think, oh my gosh, how do you repeat that when there's no more time to repeat it? So you've got to learn to come to their level. So I, I had a lot of trouble with learning styles at the very beginning and where, the, where their levels are. And so that's something that you're going to work with and, and find out. If you're working with first responders and then you've got paramedics that are there and then you might have a PA and let's say then another physician walks in. So you've got four people in that scenario, all different levels. Uh, you've got a chore in your hands. You can't just teach to the level that is yours. You have to be able to teach to all those levels and then understand that there's going to be different methods and you have to be able to feel out what these, what these learners learn by so that you can adjust on the fly how, they're going to, how you're going to teach them. And you will get very, very good at it so you won't even understand that you're doing it. You'll change your learning styles and you'll get it all adapted to them. So I think that's our last one. <clears throat> So on the learning styles, <clears throat> a lot of things happened this afternoon, but is there any questions on the learning styles right offhand? You can bring our screens up too if you would. We all got that down, down pat. Well, we'll get chances to uh, put it into play too. I know it's getting late. We've had lots of things this afternoon, so... Um, if you're okay, I think this is our last thing, right? If you're okay, rather than just take a break and then come and wrap up, do you want to just finish it up so we get out of here early? <clears throat> okay. Um, happy Harry's, here they come. <laughs> uh, well, what I'd like to do is I want to learn from you folks now um, so that we can do this better and so that we can help you out and make a lot of this better as much as we can and so that we can bring things back through the rest of the days if you have questions. So <clears throat> let's go to the very beginning. This morning on our, our very simple but introductory, introductory things that I did on what is simulation and what is SIMND all about. Are there any questions regarding that, first of all, that I can answer for you or find the answer for you by tomorrow? Has the, yes? That's a, a tentative map, and that's not a uh, definitive one. That's one of what Amy's working on with the hospital administrations, with the trying to get the numbers right, because one of the things that we have promised your hospitals is that we want each hospital group to have nearly similar numbers and experiences. So our goal is to make it so nobody's getting all the work and somebody's twiddling their thumbs waiting for work. We want you all to have as equal of experiences as we can. So there's going to be, it's not going to be a perfect map. And Amy is working on that and that'll take some time to finish up. Which ones go where?
Well, one of, the, one of the reasons for the team leader, the nurse team leader, is that contact person too. So you can use that person as the, the person who will work with Amy to get all the information and coordinate it too. So that there's some leeway there. There'll be an access, Blackboard is, you know what Blackboard is. Black, there'll be a link to Blackboard on our website. So when you get to our website, you can get easily to Blackboard. Or you can just have, you can just go directly to Blackboard right through the internet too. So there's multiple ways to get it. So if you have, for example, if you have an iPad, you can download the Blackboard app. It'll take you right to Blackboard. This is the world Blackboard, but by typing in your specific information, it'll take you to and, or you, uh, uh, SimND's Blackboard site for all of that. Or you can access it through our website. It'll be on there, too. And one other reason that the scheduling system isn't totally set when we start this week is partially because we're waiting to finish that um, uh, website thing. But we also need, Amy needs to have contact with you and the administration once we start this so we know who everybody is, then we can start finalizing that too. Well, South Dakota does not run their trucks in the winter. Okay. That's just their rule. We want to avoid that. With that knowledge, though, we know that there's going to be a lot of days where the trucks just aren't going to be able to go. Okay. There's, a, there's certain wind conditions where you're just not going to go in the wind. There's you know all other types of weather conditions, so we'll get lots of days knocked out. But... We're not, we understand too that in the summertime people are on vacation, it's hard to get them. But the other side of the coin is there's free education happening out there at your expense, at your hospital's expense and UND's and the Department of Health. So looking at South Dakota's example, they're busy in the summer. Even though they don't go in the winter, they're still busy in the summer and the places are going to take advantage of that and um, so they'll, they'll be busy. When you're out in the winter, if you're driving out in uh, 10 degree weather in the winter, uh, you've got, when the engine's running, you got heat in the back. When you shut down at the site where you're gonna go, you fire up the generator. You're, you're, you, I mean, it, you can leave it outside overnight with the generator running. We're not gonna ask you to do that, but I mean, theoretically, if you know push comes to shove, that could happen.
and in the summer when it gets too hot. So, did that yeah, answer that? You have to tailor that to your own institution and your team and the places that are going to be within your reach, what they want. Uh, if you've got, I'll just use for example, let's say Wapaton, North Dakota, they said, I'm sorry, but we cannot have any training here until after 5 o'clock on Friday afternoons, or we have to have it weekends, or we have to have evening stuff. There may be one place like that where that's the only time you can go. We don't know that yet. Um, so that, but we will, as much as we can, encourage daytime activities so you're home at night and you can get the truck back into the storage unit. Get it cleaned up for the next day and get it you know, inside and out and get it ready to go again. The, uh, the scheduling is such that the two hospital towns sometime may have to do some crossover. For example, I'll just take Fargo. If um, Sanford has gone out 15 times and Essentia has gone out 22 times, and then the, only, the next one that calls in just happens to be an Essentia-based hospital, we may direct Sanford to that place because one of our goals, remember, is to keep the training, your activity, your your experience on the trucks as equal as we possibly can. We will respect those areas as much as we can. The one thing too that I may have mentioned to some, but not everybody, the trucks cannot cross the state border. We're not, the drivers, they may be licensed to, but we're not requiring that of them, except those who are gonna help me bring them back to North Dakota. But Helmsley has this as one of their rules on the grant not even during the grant or after the grant can these trucks go over to Minnesota. I can't have Altru go over to East Grand Forks and do any training. Now if Altru has hospitals over there that they really want to work with, they can come over to Grand Forks, but it cannot cross the state border. And the reason for that, one major reason for that is, Helmsley plans to do this with Minnesota and with Montana eventually too. So in the next several years, you're going to see our own uh, prodigy out there. You know, South Dakota got it started. We took South Dakota's, modified it a lot. They're watching what we're doing, Helmsley and these other states, because they want to copy some of this stuff. And this is the first one. South Dakota didn't do it like we are. South Dakota didn't have three one-week training sessions like we are. So they're watching real close to see if this can be reproduced in some of the other states. Um, but anyway, so it's going to be a little bit different in that regard. We can't cross the states. So be very careful because it's, I, I know you, the border, especially in Grand Forks and Fargo, you work so much over in Minnesota, they can come over here, but you can't take the truck across. And there's all kinds of stuff like that we'll talk about some more too. So anything else about CIMND, what uh, policies and procedures, maybe we'll, we'll let you know some of that at, the, at that last week. Um, how about from the State Department of Health? Any questions from 
what Mr. Nering presented or what their involvement is. Again, they provide oversight. And, and I know that Mr. Nering kind of minif minimized that oversight, but their oversight is very important to us. You know, we, we take pride in the fact that we're the simulation experts, as are you, but with their oversight and with Dr. Terry Dwelly at the State Health Officer and Mr. Nering watching over all those things that we're doing, reading the grant, looking at the policies and procedures, they're going to make sure that we're doing things the correct way. We really want that. That's their obligation, but we want that as well. So that's theirs. Um, how about from uh, Dr. Jensen? I am really sorry that I can't be like Dr. Jensen. I'm not quite the lecturer he is. He was pretty phenomenal, wasn't he? And when you really get him going on the in-depth pulmonary stuff or some stuff that he, is just his expertise, and you're sitting in the class, and you're that one that's kind of nodding off back there. He is right there and saying, so what do you think the answer is to number B up there? You know, and he'll, he'll get you. But any questions on his involvement? Uh, Dr. Jensen's been involved since before our Sim Center was built over there. He's been, he was on our uh, building committee. He was, been, he was on our advisory committee, getting things set up as well. And he was also on an advisory committee helping uh, put together SIMND. So he's had involvement with this for a long time. How about anything from the standpoint of adult learning? And I'm, I'm looking for good and bad here. We're going to talk about difficult debriefing. We're going to talk about lots of lots of that. So that's a really good point. That's a really good point because, you know, as I mentioned, different people's learning styles and how it's going to hit you in the face sometime when you get out here. Uh, the same thing with personalities. You're sitting there and, you know, I'm looking at Ms. Dr. Sath is just kind of looking at me, looking a little interested. But then maybe at the end of it, I'm just about finished. His hand goes up. Then the darts start flying. <laughs> You know, I think, whoa, I didn't expect that. You know, I know that's not Jeff, but those kind of things can happen, and, you know, we have to be prepared for that. And because you are the experts, you come out with the high tech, you've got the flashy equipment, you are SIMND, uh, what does that put you up for? That puts you, you know, you're the, you're the authorities now. So what do authorities have on their backs? They have a target. At our, our previous dean... Um, told me once, and he had lots of controversy at times, but he told me once, he said, you know, when you take a position like this, you have to know that you have a target on your back, and you are going to get shot at, and there's going to be some bullseyes, and you have to be ready for that. And if, you're, if you don't plan your career for having uh, a target on your back, you're not in a very high risk, or you're not in a very challenging career. So those kind of personalities will challenge the stink out of us for sure. You might, yeah. <laughs> and, and one thing, we're not going to touch a lot on this, but generational learning styles. You know, you know, I'm at the end of the baby boomers. So here I am teaching these millennial generation and these students now that are uh, 21, 22 to 29 years old for the most part, a totally different generation who the things that formed their minds are totally different than what foreign mine. You know, I had a draft card. I remember just thinking that I'm going to have to be in the jungles of Vietnam. Uh, I remember, you know, the, the Russians are coming and, and practicing going down into those fallout shelters, how worthless they were. But, you know, I remember those. The, these kids don't know that. They didn't form their opinions based on that. We had the silent generation, those that grew up in World War II as our parents, and boy, did they form a lot of our opinions. The opinions of these young people are totally different. So, and you've already found that out, I'm sure, when you try to teach 
that those younger generations, it is a challenge. It's a real challenge. And the, the thing that we have to keep from happening is getting angry at them because that's a, that's a, that's a natural response. It's not the way we did it. You know, can't you learn it the way we did? Well, we can't do that. Then our credibility is shot. So we have to learn how to mend them a little bit, mold them a little bit, and then we have to mold a little bit too. And it seems lighthearted now, but next year, when we all get together sometime, you're going to say, wow, now I know what he was talking about. Uh, you'll, you will run into those things. So now, is there any other general things that you want to know before you head out today that maybe will help for the rest of the week, will help any kind of take-home points, anything that, we, that you don't see in the book or something that we can prepare that uh, might suit you well, that we can look up, do, have ready for you? We'd, yes. You mean, uh, Don? It's week three, okay. There you go. Yeah, you're going to be collecting a whole lot of data to the point that it it's going to get a little frustrating because you know, i got to fill out these forms again. We have to do it, folks, because that's going to help us learn what we did wrong, did right, how we can get it better. But also, also, we're going to be doing research with all this, and you're all going to be involved. Your centers are going to be involved. And then, like I told you, I am going to take this and present it nationally, if not internationally. I'd like to next January. I just don't know if we're going to have enough data pr to present next January, but the how-to, how to set it up, how to start up a program like this, that's something that they're just itching to get a hold of. And if we're ready to present, we will. If not, we're going to present in 2015, and we'll have data, we'll have outcomes data, and we'll be presenting. And I'll be looking to a lot of you to help do that. I want to present in, at IMSH 2014, with South Dakota on how to do a statewide, you know, a conglomerate statewide program. 